Hello, everyone, and welcome to Medheros Net Podcast, Season 3, Episode 17. We're live on YouTube. It's Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I'm your host, Vika Slanyan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Mike Ballion, sitting to my right, where we discuss our great Armenian history, covering different eras, topics, and people. Please hit that like button. Make sure you are subscribed and share with your friends and family. Today's guest is Tom DeWall, who will be joining us live from London and will be discussing his book, Black Garden, Armenian Azerbaijan Through Peace and War, which covers pretty much the Nagorno, the first Nagorno-Karabakh war. Yeah. war. Uh, but before we bring Tom on, uh, quick announcements. Uh, again, as we've been mentioning throughout February, uh, we are supporting um, the organization Support Our Heroes. Uh, and if you guys go to our website, uh, Medhelosna.com and use the promo code Artach. You will get a ten percent discount. Plus, we'll ma match that discount and donate it to them. Um, so please support this great great organization. They do a lot of great work in in the uh, Artach region. Um, uh, quickly, about I mentioned about the uh, animation series that we're working on, which is Forgotten Thrones, Unveiling the Secrets of a Timeless Land. Uh, everything's pretty much going great. Uh, we'll have more announcement as to the more dates, to release, and, and all the episodes that are going to take place. And then uh, as far as the uh, the Med Talk series that we're going to do in front of a live audience, uh, and the first one will be with Kevok Nazarian, uh, we are... Uh, we should be confirming dates uh, today, hopefully, and uh, and then we'll announce that uh, we're hoping sometime late March, maybe early April. So we'll announce all that information. Um, all right. So uh, today, like as today's guest is Tom DeWall, uh, who is a British author and expert in a Caucasus region in the post-Soviet space. He's particularly known for his research and writing on the conflict and politics of the South Caucasus, including the Gorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, Tom has written several books on the region, including Black Garden, Armenia and Azerbaijan through peace and war, which is what we're going to be discussing mm -hmm. today. Uh, the Caucasus, an introduction. He's also a frequent commentator on region uh, on the region for media outlets and has been published in leading newspapers and magazines such as New York Times, The Guardian, and Foreign Policy. So, uh, everybody, please welcome Tom DeWall. Hello, Tom. Hi, Hi Tom. good to see you. How are you? Oh, good, good. Thank you so much for joining us from London. We really appreciate this. Sure. Um, you know, I was introduced to your book uh, through a friend Actually, he's a listener of ours who became a friend. And, um, you know, for me, I, I moved to the States in 1988. And as a child, I was nine years old. I remember seeing all the protests. I didn't quite understand what was happening. Yeah. Uh, and it was very, you know, we have this very vague memory of, 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 uh, of what was happening, the chaos, um, but we didn't understand it because we didn't know much about it. And then we left and came here. And obviously, as a child growing up here, we, we heard about the war that was happening, but it was just like, as a kid, you don't pay attention it, to uh, it. Well, yeah. that, that and there, there was a lot of Armenian institutions here locally who were pushing certain things. But again, yeah. as a kid, you know, yeah. but we're, we're the same age. So as a, as kids at that time, we didn't really have much wrap around our minds. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, um, you know, we always saw the one sided, you know, obviously the yeah. bias side of Armenia. And uh, when I, I read your book, it really, it was very like eye opening because I didn't quite understand where it began. And I, I didn't even know some major, you know, celebrities like Silva Kapudikian, who was involved in this movement as well. So, um, and um, I, I just love the way how you told the story from both sides for, for the reader to understand the humanity mm -hmm. of what was happening. Um, so it, it, I believe it's written uh, very well and uh, un, as unbiased as possible, I believe. Um, so again, thank you. But this was published in 2003, I believe, right? Yeah, that's right. And then I updated it in 2013. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it should, I suppose, be updated um, in 2023, but I don't think <laughs> yeah. I have the 
the stamina for it, to be honest. Um, but you know, it still stands as yeah. a good as a good record yeah. um, of, of the conflict. Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. And and the and the one that I read was updated from 2013 because obviously there's a lot of stuff you talk about um, that happened, happened in that in, in, in that, that time, in that period, time yeah. frame. Uh, well, I guess every decade you got to update it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but so we have some uh, question topic questions basically, and we want to kind of discuss uh, the book. Um, so uh, first, can you tell us a bit about the background and inspiration behind the book? Like, what made you want to write this book? Right. Sure. Well, I mean, um, first of all, about me, I'm 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 a kind of Russianist. Um, I. I worked uh, a lot in Russia, and I and I visited the Caucasus from Russia, as, you know, mainly as um, actually as a student back in the late 1980s, and then uh, as a journalist in the 1990s. Um, so, you know, um, you know, full disclosure: I don't speak uh, Armenian or just very basic, um, or indeed um, Azeri. You know, I can get around with it with the taxi driver, and that's about about it. Um, yeah. But but you know for the period I was working in was still very much uh, end of the Soviet Union. Everyone still spoke Russian, and so I went and um, you know my first reporting trips um, I, I did it all basically in Russian. That was that was that was the language. Um, and um, I first you know I first went to Karabakh. It was March of 1996. Uh, I actually met Robert Kocharyan there. Um, who was then the the local president of, of, of Karabakh, um, and um, um, I was fascinated by the place. Uh, I loved I loved that visit. It was it was pretty bleak that the, the the road had not yet been properly built between Armenia mm. and Karabakh. I then first went to Baku. Uh, I guess it was the following spring. Um, um, actually, wait a minute. Um, yeah, it was. I'm trying to get my my. my um, <laughs> My dates are. I actually went to Baku first. That's right. But previous year it was 1995. So, so I, around that period, I started visiting, um, doing a lot of journalism, and you know, as as the journalist, you go to that region. You you want to pack the book to read about what's going on, um, and there wasn't one. Um, you know, I I went to um, there was a a good history book, but written by some Armenians called the Caucasian Knot. Um, I then um, there was a great book about Azerbaijan written by this crazy um, but lovable American guy called Thomas Goltz. Um, but there wasn't anything from both sides. And then I got this kind of schizophrenia that I that I was in Karabakh hearing about their struggle from freedom from from Azerbaijan about how Azerbaijan wanted to to wipe them out their struggle for existence. Then I went to Azerbaijan and I got a completely different story how about you know we were this peaceful country we had this kind of nest of armenians in the middle of us who who wanted mm. to break up our, our our country and so you, you got the, you got the different stories there um and they didn't add up and i kind of knew that both sides couldn't be right but both sides maybe could be wrong <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, or partially yeah. right as it were so anyway i you know to cut a long story short um a few years later i decided that i wanted to kind of write the book that I wanted to read, which was a kind of story of how that conflict happened. Um, and, and and also, as a journalist, tell it from a kind of human, both from a human perspective yeah. and a political uh, perspective. Um, and for me, it was also actually uh, another thing. It was the story of how the Soviet Union fell apart, because it, um, let, let's not forget that this was uh, the first conflict uh, to break out in the former Soviet Union, you know, yeah, um, yeah. people have been expecting problems in Central Asia or the Baltic states, and suddenly it's it's the Armenians who are the first people to go out in the streets in 1988. Um, yeah, it's actually 35 years this week that it happened. February of 1988 is, is suddenly yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, mass demonstrations uh, on the streets of Yerevan. You know, um, yeah, and and, and I remember those. If you look at it, them. Yeah, yeah, and I remember that my father actually went to those, participated, uh, participated to yeah. those before we came because we came in uh, uh, July of '88. But um, it it was very, uh, I you know, as a kid, I'm trying to remember and the, the feeling we had. We didn't understand what was happening, but we knew that it had to do something about freedom, yeah. something about uh, having independence. Um, and as much as they tried to explain it to us, we just couldn't grasp it as kids. No, of course you know? not. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, and, and I, like you said, that the, the way you, you've written a book, 
you can see the human side of it. And that's what I appreciate it the most. It's not just politics and, you know, the leaders. And there's a human yeah. side yeah. to the book. Yeah. And I recommend everybody to uh, uh, go ahead and purchase. By the way, I'm going to put the QR code right here. There's the book on Amazon. You guys can go ahead and purchase this. There's the audio version to those of you who I know that drive prep, a lot. Prep, so prep, you can prep, listen prep to it. Yeah. Audio book um, version. So yeah. that's, uh, that's on the screen. You guys can scan that and, and purchase the book. So, um, Tom, how did you how did you go about your research? If you can maybe discuss some of the um, the successes, and I guess maybe I'm sure you probably ran into a lot of uh, issues, mm -hmm. perhaps um, maybe with authority or whatever. I mean, whatever you'd like to divulge. How did you go about the research into sure. finding out from both sides? Well, it's you know it's a journalist's book, um, and yeah. some people have criticized me saying, you know, where's the archival record? Where's the written? Uh, uh -huh. record and that's true you know there, there there was some newspaper reporting there were one or two bits of archives but basically there was nothing much to read so my my kind of working method was to go out there um and just talk to as many people as possible um so i did about 100 plus interviews um mm -hmm. and i think my timing was very i was very lucky in my timing this was the year 2000 so the war was not long over but it was sufficient distance that people want were willing to talk um, yeah. um everyone's memories were pretty fresh everyone obviously has their own biases so so you do a lot of interviews and you kind of triangulate them and and, and you see if you've got two people telling more or less the same story particularly two people from from different sides you know you're on yeah. you're on to something um so i just i just went and talked to people and i have hours and hours it took me you know um it took me something like six months to do the interviews and all yeah. the research. and it took me another six months probably to listen back to them you know um um and i also you know i and i got some good good catches i got um you know former president levon tepetrosian right. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. i got serge sarkisian who was then the defense minister on the armenian side i got lots and lots of people from karabakh I, then on the azerbaijani side i got former president mutalibov and lots of, i got you know, I got the two generals in the, in the Shusha slash Shushi operation yeah, of Mayhem. Yeah. I got the uh, Azerbaijani general who was defending or ended up running away, and the Armenian general who who took the, the <laughs> yeah. town. Um, and then I, I did a lot of work on the whole Sumgait pogroms, which was again thirty five years um, this week, which was I think an absolutely critical moment uh, when everything yeah. completely yeah. melted down. So I, I, that was that was my working method. So I don't claim. Um, obviously, everyone, the the oral history is not a complete history. Everyone has their own biases. Of course. That was that, that was that was basically um, basically my, my my working method. And no. you know, pe people say, and people, and I think the big the best tribute I have to the book is that the people read it in the region. Um, and and everyone has their criticisms, obviously, but most, but you know, of course, everyone's going to have something to say. Yeah, but fair many people seem to think that I got it basically, basically more or less right. Um, I have another follow up to that: is how difficult of a time did you have maybe getting in contact with some of these individuals? You know, some heads of state, obviously yeah. that you've talked to. Um, beyond the, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you probably spoke to some regular people. You know, boots on the ground yeah. type of deal, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I was lucky with my timing. Uh, Azerbaijan yeah. is, um, was a lot more open then than it is now. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. The, the, the kind of paradox of Azerbaijan is that is that there was the elder Aliyev, Haydar Aliyev, mm -hmm. who was the KGB guy, the strong man, the guy, yeah. the, the one everyone was totally afraid of. But he also had a much lighter hand than his son. Maybe he was more confident. Uh, um, but but. You know, it wasn't a democracy under him, but it was a lot more open place. You could there was an opposition. You could go around and talk to people. You could travel yeah. quite. I could mm -hmm. travel quite freely in Azerbaijan. Then uh, an Armenian side was also I had. I had very few problems um, getting to talk to people. Yeah. What was it? Um, I mean, with uh, uh, Aliyev, uh, I think, like you said, he he wasn't as as strict. Uh, the I think son that, or the father? Uh, the father. The father. Uh, yeah, Haider yeah. Aliyev. Uh, I think most of it is because, it, it, at the end of the day, being both countries being under Soviet, uh, you know, rule for such a long time, Coming out of the there was this common. Yeah. Friendship also as well, because a lot of Azeris and Armenians were friends. I mean, even, you know, uh, like you mentioned in the book, over 200,000 Azeris used to live in yeah. Armenia mm -hmm. before this entire thing happened. Mm -hmm. 
So I think there was like and vice this, versa. Yeah. So I I, th- I don't th- uh, you know the, obviously they have to play their political part, but I think there was also a lot of mutual friendships in there, yeah. right? And 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 indeed, Haydar Aliyev um, was born in Armenian territory. His official biography says he was born in Nakhchivan, but that's not true. He was actually born across the border in Sisyan uh, province. And then wow. people say that when he came to Armenia uh, in Soviet times, he would slip into Armenian quite free, freely. And on conversely, uh, Serge Sarkisyan, um, former, as you know, former Armenian president, grew up in Stepanakert um, and would apparently had fluent Azeri. You know, I mean, so they, so these these people actually uh, understood each other quite well. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of you know, it's it's the kind of as an outsider, it's the big paradox of going to this region is that you find that uh, everyone basically eats the same food. They listen to yeah. the same songs that they have different words, but they're the same the same same yeah. tunes. Um, these people have a lot in, a lot in common culturally, which is why whenever it was an empire, the Russian Empire or Soviet Union, they used to get along pretty well. I mean, you knew absolutely yeah. who, that this was. Armenian village and this was an Azeri village but they would um you know they get along pretty well they come they turn up to each other's uh weddings and funerals uh, mm-hmm. quite a lot of intermarriage not not you know not a huge amount but 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 it was no yeah. taboo to marry someone from the opposite yeah. community so so the kind of tragedy was was that um they could rub along together when it was an empire but when you're talking about two nation states coming into existence then suddenly you have a lot more more yeah. problems yeah, yeah. That, it, I mean, they it's were very neighborly. Yeah, it, it's, it's, the the people were very neighborly. You know, uh, I do remember, like you know, uh, we had Azerbaijanis. You know, we we knew them as okay. They would say, oh, in Armenian, Az- Azerbaijansia. You yeah. know, like yeah. like that. And we were just like, okay, normal. whatever. We 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 didn't care. Like we didn't know. We would okay, whatever it is. You know, um, that kind of leads me to uh, my next question. Uh, what do you believe? Like the key factors were. Uh, for this conflict to erupt uh, in such a speedy way yeah. in 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 the in the Nagorno Karabakh right. region. Well, I mean, first of all, obviously, this was a conflict that 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 basically started in the early twentieth century, and you had a Karabakh conflict at that point um, when you again you had an attempt to have two independent uh, countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, back in nineteen eighteen, um, but they they they. Were more or less independent but they didn't agree on the borders um and karabakh was a real issue back then um the armenians clearly wanted to be uh independent of azerbaijan azerbaijan said you know this um this is part of our territory so there was a problem back then um 1920 the red army came in and kind of solved it by force uh, and then mm-hmm. you had this this compromise that kind of no one no one liked but everyone kind of agreed had, to which had is, to which is had to an, take um, yeah an armenian uh, kind of island of armenian autonomy within inside azerbaijan so it was a it was kind of a solution which i guess in a more democratic country you know might have evolved into something more stable you know that you that that a country a country where there are democratic rights and the rule of law yeah but the soviet union wasn't that country so it was a kind of a problem waiting to happen back in 1988 that the clearly um, when the, the Soviet policemen got a bit weaker and that, you know, force-based yeah. based, force, uh, based solution began to kind of weaken, um, then absolutely the Armenians of Karabakh were going to say, no, we don't want to be part of this uh, Azerbaijan. And equally, the Azerbaijanis were, were going to say, we don't want this to let this happen. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of was a kind of naive period, I guess. You, you uh, also in Georgia, where everyone believed, "Oh my goodness, we're going to throw off the chains of the Soviet Union, and we're all going to be free and happy and and rich um, and problem solved." But of course, um, unfortunately, so easy. <laughs> yeah. life isn't yeah. so easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 especially with something that's been around for so long. You, you, yeah, you tends to have. A, I mean, we've seen it happen time and time again in different parts of the world. Is yeah. you have a power vacuum. Uh, created. F- let me add uh, add something to that question. From 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 your research, you know, going back to the first republic of of Armenia that was formed, and then the Soviets came in. Um, as far as uh, you know, Stalin goes. I know there's there's a story about how first like that entire region was part of Armenia. 
uh, even Nahi Jevan was part of Armenia. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, Stalin, in a matter of a few days, a few meetings back when, I think you talk about this in your book, uh, all of a sudden just hands that to the Azeris. Do you, do you, what do you think, from your op opinion, was, was the motivation behind that? Well, I mean, there were three mixed regions. Um, there was Karabakh, which was basically Armenian, but you had uh, Shusha, Shushi in the middle, which, which had an, an Azeri population. Yeah. Then you had uh, Nakhchivan, which was about 50-50 back in the early 20th century. And then you had Zangazur, which was also yeah. had a big uh, uh, Azeri population. So you had three mixed regions. Um, and so, you know, um, it wasn't going to be easy um, deciding who got what. Um, um, and in the end, you know, Nakhchivan went, went to, to Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, I think Turkey's role was quite important. Turkey wanted a kind of land bridge there. Uh, Zangazur went to Armenia. I guess Armenia wouldn't have been viable without without Zangazur, yeah. which you know, you know called Sunik. And Karabakh was the most difficult one, so he ended up with this kind of uh, compromise. Uh, why did they do that? Make that um, deal? Well, I mean, I think um, they wanted to reward Azerbaijan f um, for various things, but I, th I one reason was actually economic. These 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 guys were Marxist. Uh, don't. Don't let's forget they they thought that the economy decided everything, mm -hmm. and they thought um, they there was no good road between Armenia um, and uh, and Karabakh, and there was a good road. You know, it was more economically part of Azerbaijan than it was Armenia. Okay, they're they're Armenians, but we're all going to be Soviet citizens uh, in. So who cares, Europe, right? <laughs> anyway, you know, we're all get, we're you know this yeah. nation thing is all going to be in the past. We're all going to become you know good Marxist. Uh, Worker Soviet citizens, so so it doesn't really matter. I mean that that was part of part of yeah. the thinking back in the nineteen twenties. Now, for for such a I guess intermingled or or fifty fifty areas like Nakhichev and uh, Karabakh during the time, especially after the split of the Soviet Union, you're going to have um, nationalism um, play a big role with yeah. each ethnicity, right? Um, mm -hmm. What was some of the strong points that you noticed during that time, uh, during during your time studying this and writing about this? Is what did you see on both sides, and how powerful was the nationalism on each side? I mean, very very powerful. I mean, it's it, there, there's a big essay which I found useful by there's a scholar called Ernest Gellner. He wrote a book, he wrote an essay called "Nationalism in a Vacuum," and it was basically saying. The idea of that was that you had this socialism as the kind of big idea of the Soviet Union, but that kind of no one believed in it anymore. You know, it mm -hmm. was just a kind of a few slogans. Um, it was just a few. It was you know the promise of it maybe had been strong back in the 1920s, but you know 50, 60 years later, no one no one really um, believed in it as as a kind of idea to rule their lives. Um, as the so as the Soviet Union broke up, you had um socialism withered away and the big idea became nationalism that, that we the nation state that we we that we win you know we, in the case of armenia azerbaijan georgia we start again where we left off in um 1920 1921 mm -hmm. you know we we kind of half built a state back then and we're, we'll, we'll carry on um and so nationalism was was the big idea um um and um you know, and and people believed in it sincerely, passionately. Um, you know, the trouble is obviously that you you have this kind of partial vision uh, of the world um, with a nationalist vision of the world, which you you kind of um, what do you do about the minority population? What do you do about the neighbors? What do you do about the disputed borders? And 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 that and that becomes uh, becomes obviously the the big problem. Um, and you, and you kind of it's almost as though everyone sort of picked up fighting in in 1988 1989 where they'd left off in in, in 1921 yeah wow wow yeah it's like they were waiting for the rubber band to snap after all those yeah. decades right yeah. yeah yeah um you know as as a journalist obviously when when you started doing the um the research and the interviews uh what do you think the most challenging aspect uh, uh as far as writing uh about this like the complex and and the ongoing conflict what, what what was most challenging about this yeah well as i said i got a bit of schizophrenia trying to kind of 
um, fit all the, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want to be, um, people accuse me of sort of artificial balance. I don't, don't accept that. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to sort of balance it out 50, 50. I'm just, was just trying to tell the story and you yeah. know, you can make up your own mind if you want to blame one side more yeah. uh, yeah. than the other, you know, look at some guy, you know, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not, it's, it was a horrible pogrom carried out by Azerbaijan is I'm not going to whitewash that. Um, yeah. So, um, but um, I guess I guess the problem is 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 you're trying to kind of fit all this in your head and try and work out how to tell a story, um, which you know, and I guess you just let people people tell the story as much as you can. Other people, yeah. um, I mean, I guess there's another problem, which is you know, if some of the people I would have written a bit more critically being, being a bit ruder about shall we say we're still alive alive and so <laughs> there's a bit of self-censorship in the book about certain individuals who yeah you know, were, were, were 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 quite powerful and um you know i, I wanted to wanted to be able you to don't want to step on anyone yeah. Streets yeah. Of, of stepanaket or baku without really yeah. you know, without um having my head chopped off um so you know that, that <laughs> there, there, there was there was that issue um you know if i write it wrote it again now maybe there's certain individuals I, i'd have been a bit more uh explicit about about because there was some yeah. pretty you know every, every war throws up some pretty nasty yeah individuals you know yeah war, it does. Um, wars, th wars have heroes that's the name of your podcast but they have some some big villains as well oh yeah i mean we've we've you know like we cover you know everything armenian history and and yeah. there are parts where so it's ugly yeah. it's ugly and and, and some and, ruthless but people that's the truth it has to be told doesn't yeah. matter you know um I'm, i'm i'm sure you know um the people well maybe if you update it <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna push you to update that book yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh you can don't you know, don't don't push them don't go push all them. out on them yeah. <laughs> now yeah. um tom as far as um i'm sure you've probably formed your own opinions and i'm not trying to put you on that spot but um in in your own opinion i guess what how do you think the international community could help resolve this because it is such a weird lack for a better term yeah area of geopolitics mm -hmm. i mean and it's been for centuries right so i'm sure you probably witnessed this firsthand way more than even our own people yeah, yeah. have or probably realize right because you saw this you were boots on the ground So um, let me share some of your thoughts as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, okay, if we talk about right now, it's an incredibly uh, difficult situation uh, for yeah. Karabakh with the closure of the of the Lachin Road. People are, are clearly suffering there. Um, and there are no good options, let, let, let's be honest, for those people, you know, and, and, mm. and I still know quite a few people there. Um, they've got one road linking them to Armenia, The gas supply comes from Armenia. Azerbaijan has so many cards, um, and you know we don't. Um, and nothing leads anyone to believe that Azerbaijan has any good intentions uh, for those people. Um, that they, you know, that Betray. Azerbaijan yeah. would, would rather would rather have Karabakh without Armenians, or you know, offer them Azerbaijani passports, and you know, ninety five percent of them will just leave. So you know, it's it's a bleak. It's a bleak prospect. Um, let's yeah. let's be honest about that, you know. And and for me, it's it's sad because um, I also saw the other the other side of the story was was this you know mass occupation. Uh, I mean, I don't like the word, but it basically was occupation of all these regions of Azerbaijan all those years. Um, and I was one of the people you know saying to people in in Armenia, you know, Azerbaijan's not going to tolerate this for, for year on year time yeah that 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 the, the, all these regions and we're not talking about karabakh we're talking about the regions you know yeah Agdam and fizuli and all those places um azerbaijan's not gonna just give up yeah and say yeah, okay you can, i mean you, you can have those those regions um and you know hundreds of thousands of people came so i i guess you know most armenians now would accept that they made a big mistake that they didn't weren't more open to compromise on, on giving up those regions in return for a better status for for Karabakh, which, yeah. you know, and I'm sure, you know, Armenians now would look at some of the offers which were on the table back, you know, five, 10 years ago and say, oh yeah, we should have taken that. I mean, in hindsight, question. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. benefit of time. 
uh, you know so um but but for sure it, it's it's not it's not a good outlook for the people in Karabakh. They're, they're the victims now. Um, and the, basically the only thing standing uh, in the way of a full Azerbaijani takeover is the Russian peacekeepers. And the Russian peacekeepers, as we know, well, number one, their mandate expires in 2025. Well, we don't know quite what will happen in 2025. Mm -hmm. And number two, you know, Russia has its own games and deals uh, with both Baku and with Yerevan. Russia yeah you know there's 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 the kind of rather black joke um about this conflict you know which side does russia support in the armenia azerbaijan conflict and the answer is russia supports the conflict um, yeah you know, yeah of course yeah the i mean yeah. proxy wars for for any of these bigger countries is, is always yeah, a benefit. It is. absolutely true um i, I think you know it, it, the, when you talk about the word occupation as an Armenian, I think the biggest problem is, yes, those regions were part of Azerbaijan, but there's also another aspect to this, which is the historic lands of Armenia, which I think that's one of the reasons why Armenia, uh, Armenians ourselves have an emotional, have tie, an emotional to tie to yeah. it, because if historically you go back, these lands have always been part of uh, uh, Armenian kingdoms, you have the churches, you have, I mean, so many artifacts mm -hmm. have been discovered there. So I think that's where the attachment is, where the Armenians like, okay, well, well, these are historically our lands, why would we give them back? Uh, so that that's why the word occupation kind of triggers something with Armenians. Um, would you agree with that? Well, I mean, you know, um, I wouldn't really agree with that because I mean I understand that there are places like Dadivank, which I, I visited, um, which is you know in in the now under Azerbaijani control. Yeah. I, can, I can see that that's a, a tragedy for Armenians to lose that monastery. But we're also being, you know taking the human perspective. I, I just saw regions. I, I met so many people who'd lost their homes. Azerbaijanis, you know, living first of all in camps and then maybe in some kind of crowded quarters in in Baku these were people who who you know lived um all their lives in their towns and villages um which were just lying either empty or destroyed um from from the Armenian forces and you know I, I don't think any any history ultimately can can justify that um I absolutely see the Armenian claim to Karabakh I, I see that over the years I understand that um it's a place you know with full of Armenian heritage and culture um, but but my my kind of sympathy for the Armenian cause stops at the borders of Karabakh, to be honest. And I, and I, and and you know, for me, those were yeah. They may have been Armenian in some form, shape or form, a few hundred years ago. But but for the last you know twentieth century, yeah, that's least, what I mean. I, I, that's what yeah. I mean is like there, there's the yeah. historical side. I mean, when we say our lands, obviously, listen in Armenian history, uh, there's times when you go back. You know, we had kings who had you know, controlled the mass areas, but those mass areas included, you know, Hittites, uh, uh, Persians, so yeah. many. So, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Like a, a historical lens, that doesn't mean that we want to, you know, get rid of whoever uh, other national is living there. But, no. uh, you know, obviously ho if the the ideal situation would have been that Azeris in, in Armenians live there as neighbors, you know, sure. and, and prosper. Um, so, uh, which kind of leads to my next question, um, as far as, uh, from your, from your research and what you've seen and what you've written about, uh, how has the conflict impacted the local population, uh, as a whole, like this entire region? When you say the local population, you mean, um, both, uh, on uh, either uh, side. On either side. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's shaped everyone's lives literally every last person in that region's lives over over the last 35 years i mean i don't think um you know let's just for imagine for a moment that they'd managed to both sides have managed to avoid conflict in 1988 they'd done some some kind of deal um we would just see a completely different region which hadn't there'd be no fighting that and you know this is the imaginary utopia which obviously wasn't yeah. going to happen but let's yeah. just imagine it for a moment in which they had um you know road and rail links were open between armenia and azerbaijan um the borders were open um you know there was economic links people grew up without without a war um and um you know the, um they didn't spend you know billions of dollars uh, on weapons it would just it would it, it would obviously have been a completely different place i mean i'm obviously this is a hypothetical which yeah, is a bit course. unlikely, but 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 it's yeah. you know it's it's one 
that we have to think about. Um, and um, you know, and and one big example is the mass emigration, which you know, I guess you're 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 part of it. I'm I'm sitting there, you know. Um, how many people would have stayed in Armenia if there'd been no yeah. conflict? And, and a valid point. Yeah. Um, and and not be, you know, um, using your talents elsewhere. Yeah, it's a valid point. Yeah, yeah of course. You know, it's funny. It's, it's such a simple thought, and I never even thought about that, too. Well, I mean, that's one it of the main reasons. never crossed uh, my mind. From Whenever I asked my dad, well, you know, what was the reason we, we immigrated left. to the States yeah. and left? And he's like, I saw it coming. He's like, I saw it coming, and... We we're like, you know, I don't want my kids to be growing up in this situation because at that time we would have been of age to go to war. Uh, yeah. So, so he just, you know, packed his stuff and and left. So, and I'm sure the same thing happened with the other side as well. You know. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The other side, um, I guess, just they suffered enormously. They have the the advantage of being a bit bigger. Um, you know, yeah. the Azerbaijan population's mm. you know, nine or 10 million. But yeah, I mean, it's a bit, it's obviously a big, tra big tragedy for them as well. Yeah. Now, um, Tom, in lieu of recent events, obviously, with um, the war in 2020 and some of these flare-ups that continue to happen, um, I'm sure you are still somewhat in touch with the region in terms of your research and understanding whether, um, you know, what do you think um, the future of the peace negotiations or, or resolutions kind of, if there are any, can, right. uh, what do you, what do you think about this? I mean, yeah, based he, on, I, based on how much you're following the situation. Sure. No, I, I, I follow it quite closely. I was in okay. uh, Baku and Yerevan last year. I talked to some quite oh. senior people in both places. Um, and I talked to the EU officials who, who are, working on the conflict. I just talked actually this week in London, I met the, the U S uh, envoy who, who's the new, new guy uh, from the state department. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I follow it. Um, I guess I would say the kind of weird thing is that the situation is both nearer to war and to peace than, you know, it's very unstable. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have these talks between uh, Ilham Aliyev and Nikol Pashinyan. They met four times last year and they just met again in, Munich yeah. with the mm -hmm. with with Secretary of State Blinken, um, and um, you know it could go either way. You you could have you could slip back into war quite easily um, around this situation in Lachin. Also, some of the situation in Munich is, is is quite is quite dangerous, and a lot of that depends. You know, there's one guy who's really the key guy here is Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev. Mm. You know, he's the one decision maker in in Azerbaijan. Uh, he clearly, you know, got uh, a victory that he didn't dream of back in 2020, and he clearly wants more. Um, but, you know, there's also an argument for peace. Um, uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan wants to do a deal. Uh, it's going to be a, quite a painful deal in which he basically says that, that, that uh, as he recognizes that that Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, but it, but he says that the Karabakh Armenians need some kind of international security uh, protection, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be a painful deal. But you know, I yeah. don't, no one no one is offering anything else, um, to be honest. Um, so so it's a very it's a very volatile uh, situation. I, I'm glad that the EU and the US are in there. Uh, quite involved, you know, Secretary of State Blinken took 90 minutes to, you know, chair this meeting. Um, yeah, yeah. EU President uh, Charles Michel is, you know, um, so, you know, it's, um, um, but uh, this year I think will be absolutely be critical. Um, and and funnily enough, you know, it's, it's, it's a, this earthquake in Turkey is absolutely horrendous. It's the worst yeah. tragedy in that region for, for years, but I yeah. think it's changed it does have a silver lining that the you saw this earthquake diplomacy from Armenia. That you saw the the humanitarian aid cross the bridge, the border open, and yeah. I think that's. Um, I think Turkey is going to be a bit more responsive, um, either because President Erdogan just doesn't have you know he's weakened by the earthquake, um, which means he's got to be a, a, a bit friendlier to to places like like Greece and Armenia, yeah, um, yep. you know, he, he's got to be play diplomacy a bit more. So I think, so I think he's going to be, 
and and there's also a chance. Uh, let's um, let's be honest um, that he's out in the, in the next. Yeah. If the election happens in May, he. he well, um, they're trying to postpone it. Oh, now. yeah, that's they're right. To postpone that's it. Right. It, 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 it may try and postpone it, but you can't postpone it indefinitely. Yeah. So yeah, and, and and you know, I think we can all agree um, that a change of of government would be would be good in Turkey. <laughs> of course, of uh, course. Uh, yeah. You know. Um, but do you think right. uh, um, Aliyev wants that p peace deal, or just because he's right now right. so? so uh intoxicated with the victory that he had that he just wants more and more and more uh because i, I know there's been offers on the table but it sure. seems like it, you know and every day we hear you know some kind of a uh, propaganda on their side that army like t uh, what was it last night even that they claimed that we tried to attack them and there's no right. proof of that so it's like these yeah, constant sure. constant games yeah. to yeah. try to like uh, you know start again but uh, right. the, and if i can add another thing to it we all know that the armenian army did not fight in the conflict it was it was all the new reserves these kids who were basically you know training oh, for yeah. two months and everything uh without turkey do you think aliyev can actually have another war with armenia if, if our right. army were to go all out well i mean clearly he's in a very strong position um clearly turkish uh assistance was very helpful you know, yes. let, you know they, all the technology the drones and so on were, were absolutely you know crucial in 2020 but he's now got a very he's a very pretty strong uh position um and um you know the, the armenians are definitely on uh sides definitely on the back foot but yeah. you know and, and clearly um president aliyev wants as much as he can get so it um but he, you know he's not he, he's quite aggressive but he's not crazy, should we put it that way? You know, he he yeah. he, he will push for as much as he can get, but he'll he'll try diplomacy as well. Um, and um, you know, so the people I talk to say that you know that there's a, I think they would give it a fifty fifty chance of some deal being done this year. Um, um, the um, the border demarcation, I think you've got this EU border mission on the ground in Armenia, which is helpful. Uh, the this road to uh, Nakhchivan, Nakhichevan across Armenia, I think, I think they're more or less got a deal. Uh, mm -hmm. The Armenian side clearly doesn't want to give it's its last bit of leverage. They clearly don't want to sign up to that till they, till they're confident that they're going to get, you know, get some some issues resolved in other places. Yeah. So I think it all comes, you know. So the big, big problem, as always, as it has been for thirty-five years, as it has been, you know, for a century, is is, is Karabakh and 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 what happens there. And you know, I just couldn't say. Um, uh, and you've got the extra complication that you've got a Russian track as well. That the Russians are also me the mediators. You know, every yeah. few months, suddenly, uh, President Putin suddenly calls the two leaders in and says um hey let's talk and so um it's you know it as i say i just i just you know it's we could have a lot could happen this year we could we could have another war on push deal or we can have a peace deal yeah no, there's so many so many angles i'm telling you that whole area is just a hodgepodge of yeah and now with geopolitical with, spider web i mean mess. you also have the now the EU, eu and and the yeah. us being involved yeah. and obviously there's that thing pushback from russia you know every time something the eu yeah. does or 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 uh the us does all of a sudden russia shows up and and they were showing yeah. the other day like this military really uh like i feel like it was perfectly done the really you know uh attractive uh, a female soldier like hel helping out <laughs> giving in 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 you know in Artsakh and and it's just like they're doing like if we're doing something it's like come on I mean you have your U.S. I mean uh, the Russian peacekeepers right there with the latching corridor uh, I mean they can easily open this yeah. but they're not you know so uh, it's yeah it's well so I mean many, the, the Russians yeah. are in a funny situation that they're, they're they're kind of weaker because of Ukraine um, they don't yeah. have a proper mandate for that mission. They've clearly, um, the numbers weren't very big to begin with for that mission, about 2,000 people. They've clearly they've lost a few hundred to Ukraine and probably some of their best people, officers have gone off to fight in Ukraine. So it's yeah. it's it's quite a demoralized bunch of people, I guess, left in, in, in Karabakh. Um, yeah. uh, who don't really want to pick a fight with the Azerbaijanis uh, on that road. 
Um, but I guess, you know, the other thing we have to say is, as I said, you know, those are the, the Russian, the soldiers are there, are the main reason that, you know, that the Armenians of Karabakh are still there yeah. as well. So, yeah. so we don't like, you know, we have bad things to say about the Russians, but, but we also, um, good reasons are not to want um, them to leave uh, unless Absolutely. they're replaced by, by Yeah, by, because it's completely, yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole area yeah. will be cleansed. Um, going back to the, 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 the conflict itself, can you discuss the significance uh, uh, of the Armenian and Azerbaijani perspective in understanding the, this conflict overall? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, there obviously there is more than one Armenian and Azerbaijani uh, perspective. Um, you know, I guess for you Armenians looking at Azerbaijan, it looks like a pretty scary place from the outside. But when you're in, when you're actually in Azerbaijan, you know, there <laughs> it's a much more normal place. You know, the president yeah, gives yeah. these incredibly aggressive speeches. But you go, you you meet people in cafes, and that they most of them are kind of fairly gentle bunch of people. You know you, that, that you that you're not going to be scared of, and and a lot of people, most people, I guess, in Azerbaijan supported the 2020 war. Um, but I, I see a big drop off in support for, for example, the September incursions uh, across the border. You know that we saw in. Um, in Sunik in September, mm -hmm. you, saw, you saw Azerbaijan is pushing back and saying, you know, this is, you know, we've got better things to be doing than, than attacking the sovereign territory of Armenia. So there were different perspectives. Interesting. Um, um, but, you know, clearly, you know, in that sense, it's a bit like Russia, where there are also different perspectives uh, on the war in Ukraine. You know, there are, there are millions of people who, who, who oppose it. But, you know, there's one guy who takes the decision and I, that's you know that's um again i guess the problem yeah yeah in azerbaijan yeah. um armenia you, you know as well as i do there are different perspectives there are there are people who absolutely say we shouldn't sell out our brothers in karabakh you know not one inch and there are people other people who say you know um you know guys we, we we screwed up we we look we lost this one um we don't want to give them up completely but but we've got to cut a deal with azerbaijan if we want to yeah. reach it for armenia yeah absolutely um i mean with all with everything that you've included in your book how do you how do you hope that um well i'm sure this was your initial intention but moving forward with the flare-ups in recent times how do you hope this contributes to the discourse in the in the area or the conflict itself well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just one guy who's a who's a writer. If I have helped, I guess it's because it's to kind of uh, remind people of some some things that it, that that you know some basic truths that Armenians and Azerbaijans didn't always weren't always enemies. That there are yeah. different truths out there that that they have things in common. Um, um, you know, give some different perspectives, uh, which people have, and you know, and people to this day, even you know. Um, even on the street, actually, people start, occasionally when I'm in back all year round, stop me and then recognize me and say, "Hey, I read your book and it helped change my thinking." So that you know, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's help. That that's that's good for me. Clearly, there are a lot of people out there, particularly on social media, who who you know go gunning for me, and that's that's what social media is on about. both sides but, you know, or, or or like uh, yeah, yeah on, good on, on both sides, yeah. But you know, but that's I guess that's part of what um, social media is um all about oh yeah yeah the, I mean, yeah. The, yeah, the, the keyboard warriors yeah <laughs> yeah the, the, the toxicity yeah. that could be twitter yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um but you know it's it's interesting whenever a situation like let's say the turkish situation happens and i'm not trying to get into that can of worms with the earthquake and whatnot but when you start understanding um history from both sides of whatever conflict now it could be world war one world war two whatever the case may be right it sh it sheds a completely different light on the topic yeah. it's not a matter of understanding both sides propaganda but your boots on the ground you saw things yourself you interviewed you spoke to people yourself um yes i'm sure you encountered the propaganda on both sides of things but at the same time i don't think 
a lot of Armenians maybe see the perspective of the Azerbaijani, the other side, and yeah. the Azerbaijanis don't see the perspective of the Armenian side. Great point. on a human yeah. level, right? Yeah. Not not the power structure. But it also, I, th I think the the beauty about this book again, uh, I I don't think it's it's biased, uh, and and Tom left it in a way that you make your own decision Good. of what what side. But yeah. it, it it shows again the the human side, and then it really gets into the politics of what was happening mm -hmm. uh, from both the Armenia side. And while what's happening in the Armenia side, he told the story of what was happening yeah. in Azerbaijan. So I think that that was a great way. And I, and I really encourage everybody to read this book. And and those of you who are attacking Tom, I think you should first read it and understand it and and have an open mind. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. But uh, is, is there anything uh, new you're working on? I know there was the other book that you wrote, which was the Caucasus and Introduction. Was that before this book or after? That was after, and I've written another book about uh, Armenia and Turkey, great catastrophe. We can, you know, we could spend another hour talking uh, about that as well. You know, sorry, next, interview. <laughs> next, next yeah. interview. Next, next interview. I'll, you know what you it know, is. All, these, I, places, I, yeah. all yeah. these places. I was going to say in the in the earthquake. You know, uh, Marash and uh, Antep, and you know, uh, I, yeah. I I visited them actually with a bunch of Armenians back in 2012. I my my one. grandparents are from Antep, so, so right. on my dad's side, yeah. 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 Uh, well, how about this, Tom? Uh, I, I like to read the book first, and then we'll yeah. invite you back, and we'll talk about that book. Sure. A little bit more detail, because I'm sure that's more historically, you know, yeah. a little detail, depth, more, depth, depth, more yeah. depth to it. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, anything new you're working on, or any programs coming yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working a bit on... Um, because of this war in Ukraine, I'm, I'm kind of going back to my roots and working a bit more on on, on Russia. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Russia and its neighbors, uh, Russia's failure with its neighbors. But but you know, what happens next? Uh, not just Ukraine, but but you know, Russia and the Caucasus, Russia and and, and um, Moldova and all these these places. So yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, really quick, do you are you an avid poster with some of your journalistic approach, like oh, whether social media or whatnot? Maybe people can follow you if you update frequently. Do you do anything like this? Well, I am on Twitter and I have a lot of followers, okay. but uh, yeah. I, I, I'm a bit conservative about what I post. Okay. Uh, I'm a bit one, okay. once, but twice shy on. But you know, but I I always have yeah. a page for the Carnegie where where, where I yeah. where okay. everything that I've written is, is published. Yeah. Um. Before we let you go, uh, one last question I have is what would you say, uh, we have actually Azerbaijanis who listen to and watch us as well. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you say to both the Armenians and, and Azerbaijanis? What would your message be to them from all this, everything you've experienced and seen? You know, I guess my message would be um, nowadays you've got more sources of information maybe than you ever heard had. So, you know, spend some time, you know, listening more time listening to each other not just to the to the big kind of propaganda channels but there you mm -hmm. know there's some young people out there who've got some interesting uh projects dialogue projects and you know tune into them um and you know do some mental gymnastics by you know um talking more to to, to the other side I, I you know i think i do have some faith in in the younger generation who, are, who, yeah. who are finding ways to talk to to one another uh -huh. no it's a good point that's a good point of course that's it fine. Is. uh well tom uh again thank you so much for doing this yeah, we truly appreciate much, it this is a this is a great conversation and like i said i will read that book and then i will sure. invite you back yeah. and we'll we'll have yeah. a, a another conversation um anything you want to mention before we let you go no terrific i'm just very glad to talk to you too thank you thank, thank you, you tom. tom well you have a, a great day. yeah enjoy the rest of your day take care I will. okay take care Bye. All right, everyone. Um, well, that was a great conversation. Uh, again, we 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 want to thank Tom for for joining us. Um, you know, like I said, I this book. Um, uh, I suggest you guys read it. Uh, I think everyone needs to. Yeah, yeah. Find out about both sides. Yeah, it you know, with really, everything. Again, I I it it was it was really surprising to me because I I went in I went in reading the book from a biased point of view, and then it really really opened my eyes to really understand this conflict and it's it made me think twice about how i see it now yeah you know um yeah. just just a little bit of again the qr code is on the screen so if you guys can scan that and go ahead and purchase it um besides that 
uh let's see oh next week uh again we'll be live with Gevork Nazarian yeah, very. in the studio and we will be talking about uh pretty much the first republic of Armenia um all the you know we covered a little bit with Tom about this but we're going to go into detail about how the first republic was forged and then the downfall of the first republic with the Bolsheviks and everything um let's see uh fascinating time period yeah yeah so Even in world history yeah yeah it's gonna be a good conversation i'm excited uh so uh, again uh i want to thank everybody who joined us on youtube uh the audio version will be up um uh, tomorrow morning tomorrow. and uh anything you want to mention before we call it a show no man it was just a really really good insightful conversation um and uh i gotta finish up that book yeah all right highly suggest everyone get it it's it's pretty insightful and for as far as understanding the climate of how things kind of formulated during that time yeah yeah definitely um well that's pretty much it for this episode uh again i want to thank tom for joining us and uh make sure you follow us on instagram at medhedosned uh support the show at patreon slash or patreon.com slash uh on youtube make sure you subscribe hit that uh thumbs up uh and and share with your friends and family um and uh follow, you can follow us on twitter as as well we're there not as active not as, as we active. yeah not as active we have yeah. so much happening yeah uh but again uh thank you everyone for joining us and as we always say respect one another love one another until the next episode take care of yourselves